نرحب بكم جميعا في لقاء جديد ومتجدد من لقاءات سلسله على اكتاف العمالقه on the shoulders of giants التي سعى فيها الدكتور محمد اكرم فلاح وبالتعاون مع مؤسسه نواه التنميه العلميه الى اللقاء واستضافه اهم الاسماء واكبر القامات في مجال الفيزياء المعاصره. اليوم ضيف ضيفنا ضيف مميز فاعماله تتناول مجالات عده في الفيزياء تشمل نظريه الاوتار والجاذبيه الكموميه ونظريه الحقول الكموميه في اثر التناظر وغيرها من من مجالات الفيزياء الرياضيه. لم تقف اثار اعماله على عند حدود الفيزياء بل تخططها الى الرياضيات ولهذا فقد حصل على اعلى جائزه في الرياضيات وهي ميداليه فيلدز التي تعادل جائزه نوبل في العلوم. في اواسط التسعينيات من القرن الماضي كان لدينا خمس نظريات او خمس نسخ من نظريات الاوتار يعتقد ان احداها صحيحه والباقي على خطا لكن البروفيسور ويتن فاجأ الحاضرين في أحد المؤتمرات العلمية عندما قدم نظرية تعتبر أن هذه النظريات ليست إلا حالات حدية من النظرية الأعمق التي أطلق عليها اسم الام ثيوري أو نظرية الأغشية لن نسرد قائمة الجوائز والتكريمات التي تلقاها البروفيسور ويتن لأنها طويلة جدا وستستغرقنا وقتا طويلا لكننا نكتفي بالإشارة إلى أنه تلقى أكثر من 30 جائزة من أرقى وأهم الجوائز العلمية. ضيفنا اليوم ضيف مميز، نتمنى لكم محاضرة ممتعة، مشوقة، مفيدة. دكتور أكرم، ستيج از يورز. يس، بس أي ثينك يو نيد أولسو تو سي يس تو أورجانيز إن بروتوكول جست فور ذا أوكي أوكي. نذكر الإخوة الحاضرين والأساتذة الأفاضل بقواعد تنظيم الجلسة، خلال الجلسة ستكون الميكروفونات مغلقة. آه لعدم التشويش على المحاضر بعد انتهاء الوقت المخصص للمحاضرة الذي سيكون بحدود 45 دقيقة إلى 50 آه دقيقة سنفتح المجال لتلقي أسئلتكم كتابة أو صوتا وصورة ونرحب بشدة بتلقي الأسئلة بالشكل المباشر مع الدكتور ويتن مع البروفيسور ويتن آه نرجو عدم كتابة الأسئلة الآن حتى لا تضيع في الشات يمكن تأجيلها إلى وقت فتح مجال الأسئلة في نهاية جزء المحاضرة نشكركم مرة أخرى على حضوركم وحسن استماعكم. أتمنى لكم محاضرة مفيدة. دكتور أكرم. So thank you so much, Ahmed. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Again, I mean for this uh, opportunity, it is a great honor and pleasure. Pleasure, I mean, to have you with me in this series. So I initiate this series, which I called on the shoulder of giants, like many names. I mean, uh, uh, this is, uh, I mean. Um, uh, to the quote of Isaac Newton, and um, the uh, purpose of this theory is to construct bridges between uh, great names in theoretical physics and the Arabic audience, uh, public, graduate students, and professor. So you are welcome, professor. You, maybe you can start, I mean, to tell anything, I mean, to uh, this audience, like one minute or so. Well, I simply want to thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak to all of you. And uh, I guess in the Arab world, I've visited Egypt and Jordan and just barely a little bit in Turkey. And I hope to have another opportunity to visit again, perhaps uh, when the pandemic is over and conditions are better for everyone. But in the meantime, thank you for coming today. So thank you so much, Professor Gan. So as I said, we have a mix of audience. I mean, we have uh, publics and we have also experts. So as I said, we start like a uh, night in Cybeck with questions, normal general questions. I mean, which, uh, which um, because the um, general audience have curiosity to hear from you uh, the answer about these questions, then we go to uh, hot uh, topics for, I mean, experts. So uh, when we start, uh, the main question is, as you Uh, I can't hear. Dr. Akram? Yeah, I can't hear. We lost the sound. Yes, maybe he's facing difficulties with the internet connection. Okay, and until we get back, Dr. Akram, Professor uh, Wheaton, you said in one of your lectures that M theory or string theory is right because it is shedding light on the behavior of the established physics that we know. Can you explain this idea a little bit more? Yes. Well, I would not claim that this shows that M theory is right. It's just a hint that it should be taken seriously. 
and may well be right. So uh, M theory is the attempt, the, the context in which, okay, physics as we understand it is mostly based on quantum field theory to describe microscopic things and Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity to describe very large things. Quantum field theory gives us these nice equations, but they're very hard to solve. And for example, confinement in these strong interactions is difficult to understand. Why are quarks bound in atomic nuclei? So string theory has given us models. Well, string theory has given us a framework in which we've been able to get a lot of insight about the behavior of ordinary quantum field theories for what's called strong coupling. So if you go to graduate school in physics, you learn how to calculate for what's called weak coupling when quantum effects are small. But when quantum effects are big, in other words, for strong coupling, you're largely on your own. There's no general method. However, string theory has given us powerful methods of understanding the strong coupling behavior of quantum field theories in many situations. Good. Yes, yes. So uh, I think there is a problem with the internet. I am sorry. So do you hear me, Professor? I hear you. Are you hearing me? Uh, yes, yes, I hear you. So um, as I said, so now um, maybe um, from the public uh, point of view, there is two minds of nature. I mean, there is two theories works perfectly. I mean, in the microscopic and microscopic level. But the questions at some points maybe in the to describe some problems like singularities in black holes or Big Bang, we need to merge them or to find the quantum theory of gravity. But one of the most important questions, why we search for unification? Why we just try to quantize, I mean, gravity like other approaches? Why we, uh, we quantize gravity then we need, uh, I mean, what's the necessity of the unification? Well, there are a few answers that one could give. One is that trying to directly quantize gravity has given an intractable mess, not very illuminating. That's certainly one answer. Another answer, uh, so we didn't know, uh, nobody promised us that unification was going to work, but historically it has, starting with Maxwell, who unified electricity, magnetism, and light. Maxwell wasn't even trying to, reckon to unify electricity, magnetism, and light. It just, when he made the equations make sense, that's what happens. And since then, unification has had a lot of successes. Uh, there was quantum mechanics and special relativity were brought together in quantum field theory. And the standard model combined three of the particle forces, the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions. There's no guarantee it will continue, but it's natural to wonder if it would. As for the, the claim that we're trying to unify gravity with quantum field theory, I never personally would have tried to do it because I would have had no idea how to do it. But people stumbled on what appears to be a way to do it in the form of string theory. And when that happened, it's completely unnatural to ignore it. Having stumbled upon something that has such remarkable properties, it's really our duty as physicists to try to understand it and develop it as well as we can. So professor, so um, uh, I think uh, you have the same thought as one they ask, I mean, Steven Weinberg, why the necessity, I mean, of the unification, he said, I mean, we learn from history of science that um, there are a lot of unification happens, I mean, in times of Newton, Maxwell, after that, Glasher, Weinberg, Salam, for example, and other, I mean, unifications, and this unifications led to simplicity, and yeah. be the beauty also. So, yeah. but at some point, simplicity must end at some point. And this, um, uh, I mean, end point must be the theory of everything, which will be the most beautiful, I mean, um, uh, uh, theory of um, uh, everything. So is it, do you have the same, as I said, the thought of Steven Weinberg? I mean, respect to uh, the beauty and the simplicity of nature. Well, yes, I had as Steve probably did that there's no guarantee this will continue, but we have to, we'll never learn how to do it unless we try. Oh, okay. History oh. gives us reasonable basis for hope that we can make further progress. So professor, we start maybe because we discuss about unified uh, theory of everything or theory of everything, which is string theory. I mean, all people knows uh, this is a fact right now. So um, in string theory, we start by the beginning. So as you know, this is maybe just for fun or you love, 
that most of the people who uh, initiate the revolutions are Italian, like Galileo Galileo, like, uh, for example, in, um, uh, for example, Luke Quantum Gravity, Carlo Rovelli, or Veneziano in string theory. So yeah. most of the guys who, I mean, did such kind of revolutions, I mean, start by Italian. I don't know, maybe it's just a coincidence. So um, when- More than their share anyway, even if not most. Yes. <laughs> More than their share. Okay, perfect. So when we start, Professor, with the work of Feniziano, I mean, it was a pure coincidence when he was, uh, was working on, uh, uh, I mean, uh, strong uh, uh, nuclear interactions and his uh, dual, uh, I mean, um, uh, dual model. So, and after that, I mean, to calculate this interaction between quarks and gluons, I mean, he suggests this one extended object, with, which is, uh, uh, strings, and after that, the works of, uh, I mean, uh, Green and Schwartz and other names, I mean, shows that maybe in for the uh, spectrum of those closed strings are related to, you know, the excited state of these uh, closed um, strings are related to, uh, I mean, um, uh, gravitons. So uh, my question is, um, and after that, I mean, you came with a lot of contribution and revolutionary thing, I mean, up to M theory and other contribution. So my question, Professor, if you take uh, what's called, um, um, I mean, you take a time machine and you return back, I mean, to the time of Veneziano. And imagine there is no Veneziano, no uh, green, no, no, um, uh, no strings. I mean, uh, came to uh, to um, by coincidence, like in the dual model. So, what was your first idea or first intuition? With you start with, uh, I mean, the unification. Um, I mean, uh, project. Well, I don't. As I said before, I don't think I would have even tried to unify gravity and quantum theory since I wouldn't have known how to start. No. So uh, I consider us in the physics world to be lucky that we even know about string theory. We could easily have been in 2021 not knowing about string theory. Oh, okay. So uh, you mean that maybe this coincidence and this a, a lot of facts and uh, maybe this environment who help you also to contribute and go farther, I mean. So as you said, maybe there is some luck or maybe there is some special environment starting by uh, Veneziano and the Lord and, uh, and uh, um, other contribution which make you believe with this one uh, uh, extended objects which are strings. Well, I mean, it, it seems a little bit like a coincidence that Veneziano just discovered the beginning of a theory that could combine gravity and quantum mechanics when he was really just trying to discuss strongly interacting particles. Mm -hmm. There is an analogy between the strong interactions and the kind of strings we now study for gravity, which is that quark confinement is believed to result from the fact that a little string, if you try to separate a quark from the anti-quark, a string forms between them, which carries energy. It carries more energy as you try to separate them. And therefore, with a given amount of energy supplied, you can't separate them beyond a certain distance. Mm -hmm. And that seems to, for, for reasons we don't fully understand, that seems to have an analogy with the problem of gravity and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. but the best I can say is that where progress has been made in making this analogy deeper was in the work of Matasena on what we now call the correspondence between conformal field theory and gravity in anti decidual space. Where, okay, I might say going farther back, the first step in understanding, explaining the analogy between the two kinds of string theory was by Huft. In 1974, he explained that if you have not three colors, but many colors for large n, the strong interactions is described in the standard model as a theory where the quarks have three colors. But Huft imagined a world with many colors and gave heuristic arguments that in a world with many colors, the strong interactions would be described by a string theory. And that relation between the strong interactions and string theory, we think, is why it was not a complete coincidence that Veneziano discovered the beginning of string theory when he was trying to study the strong interactions. This relation between large and gauge theory, gauge theory with many colors, and string theory 
became much deeper in 1997 when Model Santa introduced what we now know as, as the ABS CFT correspondence, yes. the correspondence between ordinary quantum field theory on the boundary of the universe and quantum gravity in the interior in a negatively curved space room. So thank you so much, Professor. So um, one of the things, so because we go, I mean, uh, um, in the uh, history step by step, and we start by the, the quest of unification, string theory, why, uh, I mean, this coincidence with Veneziano and the others. So now we go to the, uh, I mean, much deeper. So as you know, um, string theory started with bosonic string theory and with all this kind of, um, of uh, 26 dimensions and uh, um, the tycoon problems and uh, the necessity of um, add in what's called um, uh, supersymmetry. And when we add supersymmetry, we uh, have, I mean, five version of um, uh, uh, super string theories. And after that, I mean, my question is, um, at that time in 1995, I mean, when uh, you went to this conference and you announced that maybe this five, um, um, I mean, uh, super string theories, um, uh, theories are just uh, maybe dual to each other and uh, they are unique. So why, what's your intuition behind using dualities? Is it like just uh, uh, addiction, physicist addiction to symmetry and dualities? I mean, or there are an, uh, other intuitions, I mean, much, much deeper, like me, um, uh, as you mentioned before, the work of Ashokson and the uh, work of Schwartz uh, about dualities, which make you maybe um, in 1993 and 1994, which make you maybe uh, have intuition about using these dualities to unify these five uh, supersymmetric theories. Well, I have to say, I didn't start with any addiction about duality. And I wasn't even sure I believed it. The first time I heard about the idea of strong weak coupling duality in four dimensional gauge theory, exchanging electricity and magnetism, was when Michael Tia showed me the work of uh, David Olive and also Olive Montonin and Goddard Notes and Olive. And my initial reaction was to be skeptical that the proposal was right. There were a lot of technical flaws with it and not that much concrete evidence. So, so anyway, Tia encouraged me to go to London and talk to Olive, and I did. And by the end of the day, Olive and I had seen that a supersymmetric version uh, avoided some of the problems with their initial proposal. So we refined the proposal to a proposal for duality of some supersymmetric gauge theories. But I still didn't take it terribly seriously. It took a long time to learn that A, these dualities are true, and B, they answer questions about the behavior for strong coupling that you really can't answer in any other way. So, so uh, I'd, say, I'd say it's a lesson we learned from hard experience. And at least in my case, I don't think I was particularly prompt to understand that it was an important direction. Despite so writing think, one of the important early papers. I think, Professor, as you said, I mean, uh, the story is, um, I mean, if you go back directly and go to the history, I mean, the, the story was uh, starting by uh, the original paper of uh, Van Tonen and um, uh, and uh, and Olive David Olive I mean and I know I mean uh, that you discuss in one of your interviews about uh, your visit uh, to uh, Professor Atia the Greek mathematician to Oxford then uh, he asked you uh, maybe to uh, I mean travel to Olive David Olive to discuss about this paper. But I have just one comment because I, you know um, these things and I want your uh, maybe opinion if I, I, am I right or not. So if you go deeply to this, uh, I mean, paper of Mantonen and uh, David Olive, you will find that they use uh, what's called, um, uh, um, I mean, uh, a bosonic field theory and a scalar, um, um, I mean, a scalar field. And they assume that the potential energy of the scalar field is maybe, is definitely zero. Yes. Sorry for so interruption. At that time, when you are visiting, you visit, uh, what's uh, called when you visited um, uh, David. O, you think that ha you have like a belief that it's quantum mechanically has no sense that you have a theory that uh, I mean has uh, a potential energy uh, equivalent to zero. Yes, quantum mechanics. Uh, 
facing difficulties by hearing you. So can you be, be make the mic closer to you? You're having difficulty hearing me or hearing Mohammed? Uh, or... Hearing you, Professor. Yes. So if it's possible yeah. to make mic closer to you, it would be great. Well, I can... Uh, I'm sorry, you should have let me know before if you were having trouble hearing me. No, it's okay, but I'm facing this difficulty. I okay. think now it's okay. Thank you. Okay, well... Mont well, Montonin and Olive, the first, the very first paper was by Goddard Neutzenhoff, who showed that monopoles looked like kinematically they could be dual to electric charges. But the first proposal for a, a theory that would have a symmetry between the two was by Montonin and Olive. It's the paper you're mentioning. And there were definitely technical flaws. As you say, they assumed that the potential energy for the scalar is zero. And that's a combination of being ill-defined and impossible quantum mechanically, hmm. depending on exactly how you interpret the statements. So, but uh, Professor, it makes sense if you discuss this uh, model, I mean, using supersymmetry, because- Yes, that's right. That was, one, yeah. okay. that was the original reason that Olive and I started to talk about supersymmetry. The, the assumptions that, the technical assumptions Montana and Olive had made, made more sense in a supersymmetric case. Are you hearing me better now, by the way? Yes, Professor, I think. Yes, thank you so much. So technically their assumptions made more sense in the supersymmetric case. But then when we discussed the supersymmetric case, there was something even nicer, except I drew the wrong conclusion from it later. But they have these nice formulas for the masses of particles. And it turned out that you could explain those formulas purely algebraically in the supersymmetric context using properties of the supersymmetry algebra, using the fact that the supersymmetry algebra contains what are called technically central charges. And then you could explain their formulas, which is a beautiful fact. And there are two conclusions you could have drawn and I drew the wrong one. So the conclusion I drew was, I tend to be conservative. I don't accept radical hypotheses unless there is what looks like strong evidence. And we had been able to explain the mass formulas of Montana and Olive without assuming duality. So my conclusion was, there's no strong evidence for the duality. So, uh, at, that, so, so me, at that time, Professor, when you write, I mean, uh, in N equal to two super symmetry, so you are yeah. conclude, but you now uh, know that this conclusion was wrong at that time. Well, in the paper, we didn't say this, but per my private conclusion was that we'd explained the Montana and Olive mass formula without assuming duality. And therefore it didn't really represent evidence for the duality. Now a different conclusion somebody could have reached was the Montana and Olive mass formula is predicted by the duality. It turns out it's true. That encourages us to believe the duality is correct. With hindsight, we know that second interpretation is the right one, but the conclusion I drew was the first one. And therefore after writing that paper with Olive, I didn't try to continue working on the subject for many years, not for, more than 15 more years. So, and by the time I was working on it again, uh, more had been learned about other kinds of dualities. So there were more hints for taking it seriously. So at that time, I mean, before even, uh, because I will discuss the next step, as I said, I mean, step by step, I will discuss about uh, the paper of Schwartz and Ashoksen about, uh, I mean, uh, uh, calculating the low effective action of heterotic yes. string, I mean, on six dimensional torus, which yes. is, I mean, uh, sufficient to uh, what's called, um, I mean, this du uh, SL2Z duality. So uh, before this, I mean, paper, uh, as you said, you were not more adventurous and you were more conservative, but after maybe this Ashoksen um, uh, and Schwartz, uh, I mean, paper, yeah, I mean, you change your mind and maybe you have more uh, motivation to go farther. Well, that's true. Although what changed my approach even more was another paper Sam wrote a little later. But to tell you about the paper you're writing now. So it was a little bit like my paper with Olive in the sense that the supersymmetry algebra was strong enough that they could compute a lot of things. And the things they computed were consistent with the duality. But I, their interpretation was that it was evidence for the duality. And by, I think their paper was in 1993, maybe. By that time, with a little more experience with different kinds of dualities and similar, in simpler problems, 
I was more willing to believe that interpretation. So I didn't think they had bulletproof evidence. And you could, a skeptic could have said the same thing about their paper that I had originally said actually about my paper with Olive. But anyway, so it was like, yes, it, it was like a subtle point that they, uh, I mean, reach a point about uh, non perturbative uh, string the dualities, which at the time you didn't believe that we, may, we, we can reach such decision at, uh, I mean, maybe this early time. Well, uh, sorry, that's certainly part of my attitude during this period. Mm -hmm. So I was reasonably skeptical of Montana, whether Montana and Olive duality was true, but I also was skeptical that we would be able to decide if it was true or to use it even if it was true. Now, for a whole, because of a variety of things that had been discovered in the eighties, by the time of the Schwartz Sand work, I was less skeptical. You could have expressed the same skepticism, but I was less likely to do so, less tending to do so. But what really that... changed my attitude, if I could interrupt you, sorry, is that at the beginning of 1994, Sen wrote a paper that really was very simple on a bound state of an electric charge on a monopole or two monopoles on an electric charge. And it was a very simple paper. And if you had the right idea, it could have been written before, but of course, no one had had the right idea. And it was fundamentally new evidence for the duality. And that really did completely change my attitude because before Sen's paper, you could say that all arguments for the dualities were somewhat similar and maybe were being misinterpreted. But Sen's paper was just completely different. And I gave up on my skepticism after that. And then a lot of things happened. For one thing, Cyborg and I had been, uh, you, you of course interviewed Cyborg in one of these. Yeah. Yes. podcast not that long ago. Um, I don't know how much you talked about this, but Cyborg and I have been trying to understand the dynamics of n equals two super young mills theory uh, with some speculation that duality had something to do with it. But after Sen's work, it was much easier to believe that and to concentrate on that direction, which turned out to be the right one. By the way, Professor, I mean, thank you so much to tell me, I mean, the right intuition about uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the work of my um, of uh, Cyberg and Witten theory, because when I asked Professor Cyberg, I told him why, especially you are interested, you, uh, you were interested about N equal to two super young means theories, the vacuum, maybe. I was thinking that because the vacuum, I mean, has, um, uh, I mean, the structure of Kahler manifold and such kind of manifold is a special, is unique because it's equipped with three different, I mean, uh, structures. So he said, um, Maybe this is one of things, but it's not mathematical, I mean, intuition. But now, I mean, you tell me what's the right, I mean, maybe motivation behind the uh, Cyberg and Witten theory. Well, uh, I'm not sure if you're asking me what's the motivation for studying the problem or the motivation. I, for said, the uh, I said, Professor, because now you discuss about, um, I mean, um, uh, I mean, the Ashoksen, uh, I mean, uh, uh, paper about uh, the monopoles, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and you said this is make you, I mean, uh, motivate about these dualities. And mm -hmm. after that, you go, yes. But I'm sure as Natty probably told you, there were other motivations. So so Maddie, I can, I want to hear from you those, uh, I mean, motivations also. Well, I'll, see, it's actually hard to remember all the motivations from the period, but I'll tell you two. Mm -hmm. One which was, well, Natty had previously studied N equals one supersymmetric theories. So to him, it seemed natural to look at N equals two, but there was a, 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 an almost contradiction in N equals two that really puzzled him, it puzzled me too once he explained it. You could add a bare mass to the scalar multiplet of the n equals two theory. It had a vector multiple and a chiral multiple. You could give a bare mass to the chiral multiple breaking n equals two to n equals one. And then it was believed the theory should be confining. So in other words, similar to the strong interactions where you can't separate quarks. But it was very hard to understand how non-confining theory um, suddenly becomes confining under a small perturbation. Now, Way back in the 70s at Hooft and Mandelstam and Polyakov and others had said that confinement has to do with condensation of magnetic charge. And Cyberg tried to uh, interpret what was happening with the confinement 
uh, as some kind of condensation of magnetic charge, and that proved to be correct. Although understanding it technically took a little more work. Anyway, one motivation was to understand confinement. The other motivation was that actually, I had discovered earlier that Donaldson theory of four manifolds can be viewed as a twisted version of N equals four supermagnetic theory. Hmm. And so there was a possibility that understanding N equals four supermagnetic N equals two, I, I think I said N equals four, but I meant N equals two. There was a possibility that understanding N equals two supermagnetic theory better would um, lead to progress with four manifolds. That happened later. But to be honest, I wasn't very optimistic that it would happen. So I'm, it's very difficult to remember to what extent that was my motivation going in. Uh, so uh, professor also, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think you know, and you said this also before. So uh, one of the things which make you, in the, I mean, make a deep understanding of uh, these dualities, um, I mean, uh, non perturbative dualities is to understand um, uh, the conformal field theories in six dimensions. So why six dimensional conformal the field theories make us, I mean, understanding those um, uh, dualities? Well, there's an abelian version of this, which was first pointed out by Michael Duff. If you simply take what's called a self-dual tensor field in six dimensions. So that's a two form whose curvature is constrained to be self-dual. It's a consistent quantum field theory in six dimensions. It's free, but despite being free, it's very subtle. Uh, it's very, very, very subtle to describe it properly. Well, Duff showed that I think he explained it slightly differently from what I'm telling you, and I have trouble remembering exactly how he said it. But he showed basically that this theory accounted for electric magnetic duality of abelian gauge theory in four dimensions. In the sense that in four dimensions, you could take Maxwell's equations, say just for the free photon field, the free electromagnetic field. It has a symmetry that exchanges electric and magnetic fields. Now, Duff's point of view essentially was that this subtle self-dual theory in six dimensions if you compactify it on a torus, a two torus, you get a four dimensional theory that at low energies looks like Maxwell's theory. But the electric magnetic duality of Maxwell's theory comes from a, a geometrical symmetry in six dimensions. Just a rotation of the two extra dimensions turns into, in four dimensions, the quantum rotation between electric and magnetic fields. So, When, when there started to be some success in applying dualities to string, strong coupling behavior of string theories, it turned out that you could give examples of uh, Duff's idea at work in string theory. But specifically for the answer to your question, I noticed in the summer of 1995 that if you take what's called type 2b super string theory and compactify it on a four manifold and you let the four manifold develop a certain kind of singularity, you get a very exotic six dimensional theory. And this exotic six dimensional theory contains the secrets of four dimensional dualities. If you compactify it in the two torus, the geometrical symmetries of the two torus become quantum dualities in four dimensions, specifically for the n equals four superangles, which is the home of Montone and Olive duality. So, uh, Professor, what's now your new um, actual, I, I mean, actual vision about non perturbative uh, string dualities? Uh, I don't think the picture has changed that much in a long time. So, the picture is that when you take strong coupling into account, there's really only one string theory, which is the candidate for superunification. And it's got many different manifestations in different dimensions with different fields turned on, but they're all different manifestations of one theory. And it's one theory that, well, I'm not sure whether to say it can't be properly understood by quantizing a classical theory or to say that no such interpretation does justice to it. It can be related to class, it has many different kinds of classical limits, but it's a theory whose Deep properties only emerge quantum mechanically. Okay, 
So, uh, Professor, again, so we can go also, I mean, to one of the, your contribution. As I said, maybe many of the audience, I mean, young or old guys, I mean, working about these things. So they worked about um, maybe a two plus one uh, quantum gravity. It's mm -hmm. your contribution in 1988. So um, maybe we need also to discuss about these things. So uh, one thing maybe it's hard at that time is to quantize gravity. I mean, in three plus one, which is three dimensional space and one time. And um, after that, I mean, you, you, most of the people interest about two plus one. Is it just, I mean, um, uh, to learn, uh, how to say, to learn, I mean, some lessons uh, about how to quantize gravity in three plus one. So we need to start much simpler in two plus one, or there is other motivations? Well, that was the idea, hoping to learn some lessons. But that hasn't happened very much in two plus one dimensions. Uh, I think my original claims were too optimistic. And what to say about two plus one dimensional gravity is not well understood even today. However, there has been success in the last few years at learning important lessons from an even simpler model. The simpler model you could think of as a compactification from two plus one to one plus one, but it can be described just in one plus one dimensions. It's a theory in two dimensions, one plus one, of a gravitational field plus a scalar field and people call it Jakeev Tidable in Gravity, since they were, well, probably the first to consider this highly simplified model. So they, their work was done in the 80s, more, thir more than 35 years ago. And only in the last few years did we learn important lessons from it. I think, uh, Professor, also one of the deep insight, I mean, and you are agree uh, with me in two plus one, instead of uh, simplicity or taking lessons, I mean, for solving the problem of three plus one, um, other things maybe is to, uh, the other, I mean, uh, quantum field theories are, I mean, there are a gauge symmetry, but we don't know how to include gauge symmetry or gauge uh, invariant form. Uh, with uh, Einstein general relativity. So maybe we can change the formalism. And when we try to do it, uh, as you uh, did, I mean, and uh, before other names also, in 1988, I mean, uh, when you change um, to the topological uh, field theories, which is shared Simon interactions, maybe uh, the language of um, the spin connection and verbine make, I mean, um, Einstein, Hilbert action much simpler, and maybe uh, the theory uh, can be gauge in varying form. So uh, is it th this also one of, um, I mean, the motivations or? Uh, at the time, I thought going to the Fairbine and spin connection would eliminate the technical problems in the metric formulation. Uh, part of that is true, at least in perturbation theory. But I, as I've said a few minutes ago, I can, in hindsight, I think my claims were oversimplified. And even today, one doesn't know what one should be saying about the theory. However, one true fact is that the metric and the Fairbine spin connection formalisms are equivalent, at least in perturbation theory. So it is true, at least in perturbation theory, that that reformulation avoids the ultraviolet difficulties of the Einstein theory. I, but anyway, see, my thought at the time was that okay, in the Fearbind formulation, it only has a geometrical interpretation if the Fearbind is invertible. And in the Fearbind formulation, it's not natural to require that the Fearbind is always invertible, at least in the gauge theory interpretation, you wouldn't require the Fearbind is always invertible. So my vision at the time, uh, it seems at best oversimplified in hindsight, but my vision at the time was that we should forget that the fear bind is invertible and work in this bigger framework. Uh, professor, for this, uh, I mean, property of verbine, which is the uh, invertible verbines, I mean, in classically, it's obvious. But in quantum mechanically, I think at that time, many assumptions they use, I mean, that the verbines is invertible. I mean, I don't know if this is just an assumption, um, assumption useful assumption to go farther. 
because uh, this is maybe helpful in perturbative regime, but in non-perturbative regime, I mean, there is what's called, uh, you, you cannot neglect the known invertible verbine. So I think one of your contribution is to, um, uh, I think you suggest at that time in non-perturbative regime, the degeneracy of the, uh, the, the verbine. So uh, can you tell us about this thing? Well, I can tell you, but I've indicated that uh, I, 35 years later, I think what I said was oversimplified. Mm. But my idea at least was that we, in two plus one dimensions, we would take the gauge theory formulation as more fundamental than the metric formulation. And in the gauge theory formulation, we don't constrain the shear bind to be invertible. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that have been discovered since then. One thing is the BTZ black hole. So at the time I was writing, it wasn't understood that in two plus one dimensional gravity with negative cosmological constant, there's a black hole. And one of the things you'd most like to describe in this theory is the black hole entropy. The gauge theory framework that I wanted to work in hasn't been successful in describing the black hole entropy. Another thing that's been discovered since then, there were glimmerings of it already in work of Hawking, but it was really not stated clearly until the work of Stanford, Schenker, and others in just in the last few years. Gravity is chaotic, or black hole physics is chaotic. And that poses a real problem to trying to describe it in terms of a soluble model, like two plus one dimensional gravity viewed as gauge theory. So, okay. But you see, as I said, I think even today it's not understood well what you should say about two plus one dimensional quantum gravity. There was progress in one plus one dimension in the last few years, but the two plus one dimensional case is still quite obscure. There have been interesting works in the last couple of years, but I would say overall it's still quite obscure. Uh, one of the things, because uh, as you discussed, I mean, when you are working on two plus one quantum gravity and you did, as I said, the similarity between them and uh, also uh, um, um, what's called, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and uh, I mean, I uh, forget what I am saying. So as I said, so now uh, your work about uh, two plus one, I mean, a topological uh, quantum gravity, which is, I mean, equivalent to Shan Simon topological field theories. So from this, I think um, one of your last contribution is to focus about uh, maybe three plus one, which is four dimensional Shan Simon theories. And this is uh, also the, I mean, maybe in the context of, uh, uh, I mean, a Costello work, I will discuss uh, in much uh, details uh, after that. So why right now, or few uh, uh, past years, uh, are, are you interested about maybe a uh, four-dimensional Shen sign? Well, in, in my work in 1988 on Chern-Simons three-dimensional three Chern-Simons, mm. I constructed not invariants. I gave a more physical explanation of the Jones polynomial than not and its generalizations. Jones and others had related the Jones polynomial to solutions of the Yang Baxter equation at special values of the spectral polynomial. Okay, okay, let me make a less technical explanation. What is a knot? You've got a bunch of particles moving around in three dimensions. So you could draw a picture of two, two lines crossing. And that's an important ingredient in knot theory. On the other hand, there's the yang baxter equation of integral systems in two dimensions, where you consider particles intersecting in a plane. It's a very similar picture. And Jones had used special cases of the solution of the yang baxter equation. Well, the solution of the yang baxter equation has a spectral parameter, which Jones only used at special values. But if you consider the whole structure, it leads to integrable mathematical physics in two dimensions. What Costello did was to consider not three-dimensional Chern-Simons, but a four-dimensional version of Chern-Simons. And he showed that by, well, by going from three to four dimensions and roughly otherwise doing the same things, except it's technically it's quite different to do it. Uh, he could explain the integrable systems. That actually, uh, Atia had basically recommended doing something like that back in the eighties, but I and everybody else had been unable to do it until Costello showed how. And what Cassell did was very subtle, even if he thought of using the four-dimensional transignments to show that it does describe integrable systems, 
is quite tricky. I think what Costello did is quite amazing, even after you have the basic idea. Even if somebody tells you the basic idea, it's pretty hard to do what Costello did. So, pro uh, Professor, when uh, I mean you focus, I mean on the um, Costello solution, I mean about the spectral uh, parameter, you, you find that he did just, uh, I mean, his twist is just uh, what's called, um, uh, he add one, um, uh, one uh, what's called dimensions and the spatial dimensions became complex. So it's a simple uh, mathematical trick, but, um, but maybe uh, um, you saw that this is a motivation, I mean, to think uh, about the problem again. But mainly, what's your problem before? I mean, when you try to calculate this spectral, um, I mean, uh, parameter, was it because you are focusing on three-dimensional topological things, a few theories, so um, that, that are uh, not obvious of Euler characteristic of those things, or what's the problem exactly? Well, exactly. Well, there are multiple places where the, I had multiple difficulties. So one of them is okay, the ang baxter equation of integral systems has less symmetry than not doing this. So there are lines moving in the plane. Not theory has three-dimensional symmetry and integrable systems only have two-dimensional symmetry. I didn't adequately take this into account in my thinking around 1990 when I tried to solve this problem. What Casella did, he took three-dimensional turn assignments. He split off one dimension and he treated it differently from the other two. He replaced that one dimension by a complex variable. In this way, he broke the three-dimensional symmetry, leaving two dimensions where he had symmetry and the third one was treated differently, becoming complex. So that was okay. That would not be okay for knot theory that has three-dimensional symmetry, but it was okay for describing integral systems that only have two-dimensional symmetry. So that was one step in Casal's work, but there were a lot of other steps. So professor, in your case, you were able, I mean, uh, to use two equations, not just a, a Baxter equation, but also Reimster moves of the crossing um, to describe the crossing of the nodes. Is it right? Am I right? Well, in three dimensions, you have Reutemeister moves. Uh, and in two dimensions, you've got the Ang baxter equation. And they look similar. And Jones had used this similarity in his work on knots. But although, although they're similar, there are important differences. And to explain the integrable systems in terms of gauge theory, it's just as important to understand the differences as the similarities. And as I said, Costello neatly took into account the differences by splitting off one of the three dimensions of Transignments theory and replacing it with a complex variable. Uh, Professor, when we return back, because now we uh, discuss about Chern Simon, uh, I mean, you have also a contribution because um, in quantum gravity, even right now, the loop quantum gravity guys, they use uh, this duality, which I think you know and you contribute, which is CSWZW correspondence, which is Chern Simon and do a vest Witten uh, uh, Zumino uh, duality. So, um, uh, uh, at that time, I mean, most of people, they said that Juan Maldicena in 1997 was, I mean, create or initiate this idea of ADS-CFT. But, I mean, when started, I mean, looking of this, for example, duality, because C.S. Shen Simon, it was three-dimensional, um, I mean, topological field theory, whereas Zimino Witten was two-dimensional conformal field theory. And uh, it was, I mean, a duality which uh, you did. And after that, the work of uh, Strominger and uh, also the other works of BTZ uh, black holes with the negative, I mean, um, cosmological constant. Yeah. Do you think that all this contribution lead to um, Maldesena to conclude or to um, uh, write down this ADS-CFT correspondence? Or, um, yeah. I actually think Maldesena arrived at it from a different direction. I think what really stimulated him were the computations that were done in those years by Klebanov, Amanda Pete, Steve Gubser, and a couple other people who were studying low energy interactions of matter fields with brains. And, well, okay, very roughly, they were understanding the physics on a brain by looking at the fields that the brain creates. And they were doing concrete calculations. And Montesana proposed there was going to be a complete duality 
between the brain and the geometry it creates. So I think that to answer you, Malzahn's starting point was different from what you asked. But with that said, it is true that both my work and also the work of Brown and Hanel uh, on ADS-3 and probably some other things I'm forgetting. Yeah, definitely some other things I haven't mentioned could be regarded as early precursors of uh, holographic duality. Uh, professor, also at that time, I mean, when you are thinking about the non-perturbative quantum gravity, why people, I mean, start thinking, especially string uh, theorists, uh, theorists or string theory community about non-perturbative regime with cosmological, with negative cosmological uh, constant. It, was it hard to consider the, a positive uh, cosmological constant or because maybe they think about uh, some, uh, I mean, um, cosmic objects like BTZ black holes. So they took this model and they worked on. Technically, it's, technically positive cosmological constant is much harder. Hmm. But we don't fully understand why. I can tell you some of the technical reasons. One is that you can have unbroken supersymmetry with negative cosmological constant. You can't with positive. And unbroken supersymmetry makes many things technically much easier to understand. Another thing is that positive cosmological constant, you have the de Sitter entropy, whose physical interpretation is still not well understood today. Negative cosmological constant, you have a standard field theory with a vacuum state and ordinary physics around it. Uh, positive cosmological constant, the physical interpretation is not that well understood. And it's very hard to find solutions. In fact, it's somewhat controversial whether there are any to sort of solutions in string theory. Uh, but uh, Professor, also I think Strominger at that time uh, also, I mean, initiate some another duality called DSCFT. So uh, uh, is it, I mean, useful or um, uh, just a, a model, I mean? Well, it might become useful. It's not, the anti to sitter the ADS CFT duality is well, clearly formulated and well established, and has been the framework for a lot of discoveries. DS CFT, whatever we understand, is much more primitive. Okay. So, uh, Professor, maybe I go to the last, um, I mean, your contribution in the past few years, I mean, which is Kovan of homology and the works on no theory, just a um, few. So when I was, I mean, in, um, uh, I took another master in, in, theoretic, um, in mathematics in University of Cape Town. And um, I mean, um, uh, one of the courses was, was not theory and we discussed about this John Polonomials on and uh, all things. So what you make, I mean, your contribution that you have a deep insight or maybe uh, something more fundamental about this, uh, I mean, uh, uh, mathematical structure that, for example, uh, the particles from A and B, I mean, can follow um, uh, quantum mechanically any paths, and we can associate each random path to um, maybe to a knot, and uh, each knot has number, which is John polynomials, and after that, you construct all uh, these things. But the, as you said in one of your lectures, that all this kind of thing is mathematical. Then uh, uh, Kovanov came and make uh, the note itself, I mean, uh, physic physical, uh, which is um, uh, the Hilbert space of all states uh, of uh, uh, this quantum note. So what do you think, or maybe you can give us uh, um, uh, a small idea or review about this uh, contribution about, I mean, going from not the region polynomials to Kovanov homology. Well, Kovanov's advisor was Igor Frankl. And I remember around 1990, Igor Frankl told me, in his opinion, there should be a four dimensional theory that if you compact it in a circle would reduce to Chern Simons theory in three dimensions. And I thought that was completely wrong because there's no, see classically it's completely wrong. There's no action you can write in four dimensions whose dimensional reduction will give you the Chern Simons form in three dimensions. So I thought Igor was wrong, but he didn't take my advice and he worked on it. He eventually worked on it with some students and they got partial results and eventually Kovanov found out how to do it. So quantum mechanically, there is a four dimensional theory whose reduction to three dimensions is Chern Simons theory, though classically you can't do it. And this fascinated me, but for years I had no idea what to say about it. I should say that the first physics proposal that was on the right direction 
was by Vafa, Schwartz, and Gukov. So may, possibly you talked about it when you interviewed Vafa, or maybe not, I don't know. Regardless, there, there was some progress, but I still didn't understand it well. But, well, anyway, it's kind of a long story how I got into it, but eventually uh, I did find a way to understand physically Coven lophomology. And the important thing is that it's not classical dimensional reduction from four to three dimensions. There is a four dimensional theory that you could, you have to do two things. Yeah, you apply electric magnetic duality in four dimensions and then you dimensionally reduce. Anyway, Coven lophomology is not simply dimensionally reduced to the Jones monomial. From a physical point of view, there's electric magnetic duality involved. So, uh, Professor, um, at that time, I mean, what's um, the first motivation or what's coming to my mind for the first when you think about Knott's and John polynomials, I mean, and the relation between them and gauge uh, theories? So what was your motivation? Is to solve some problems or was just a link to connect those two? Well, originally, uh, well, there have been discoveries about the Jones polynomial that related it to physics but in a way that didn't seem to give any systematic understanding. And Michael Atiyah, the famous mathematician was recommending it as a problem for physicists to understand it better. And well, I got lucky enough to notice that you could interpret it in terms of Chern Simons theory. Then when Kovanov found the four dimensional theory, for a number of years, I found it very frustrating that physics seemed to be powerful enough to explain the Jones polynomial but not its generalization of Kovanov homology. So well, I mean, that was very frustrating, but for years there was nothing I could do about it. So eventually when I did see what to do about it, that was satisfying. So um, also professor, so we go to the recent maybe uh, contributions as you discussed before our meeting, which is um, one of the things in uh, my field, which is holographic entanglement entropy, which yep. is starting by Ryu Takinagi, uh, I mean, entropy formulas and uh, yep. all the things. So my questions, um, I mean, first, I am interested in about one question, then the second one. So because we discuss on EDS-CFT correspondence and one of the fashions today in cosmology, and um, um, I saw it that many people thinking uh, or interested about um, the cosmic uh, objects, which is, uh, I mean, transversible wormholes. I mean, like LQG guys uh, and um, even a string community, especially Maldesena, Saskin, and the others, and the stability of those objects. And after that, Ahmed Al Mihiri was, uh, was, I mean, applying this idea of replica wormholes to, um, uh, I mean, solving, trying to solve in the uh, black holes. Uh, I mean, loss information paradox. So what do you think about this motivation and this method to use in, uh, I mean, those uh, objects to solve big uh, paradox in theoretical physics? Well, it's come as quite a surprise how wormholes have been used to shed light on some of the deep mysteries about black holes. Mm -hmm. And the, the work of Almeri and some of the other, his young co-authors, uh, by now it's almost two years old, but it, it really still feels like an earthquake. So Hawking had described black hole evaporation and had, you know, he had described black hole evaporation semi-classically and had presented paradoxes that the semi-classical evaporation raises. And Al Mary and his co-authors and also Pennington were able to resolve some of the paradoxes by showing how you could give a sensible semi-classical calculation of the black hole entropy and its time dependence, as well as the entropy of the radiation that makes perfect sense. So I think I'm... So I think, Professor, from uh, Hawking, I mean, um, for example, the, the Hawking-Einstein, um, Bekenstein, I mean, entropy formula. Then after that, there is the formula, I mean, uh, of what's called uh, von Neumann formula, 
uh, and uh, the work, as I said, of Ryo Takinagi, I mean, which try to, uh, I mean, um, try to match this, uh, what's called uh, thermodynamics entropy and uh, uh, the entanglement entropy, um, I mean, uh, using th th their, I mean, contribution, what's called, I mean, the Ryo Takinagi formula, which, I mean, after that, Ahmed Al Mihiri and the other use it. So, um, as I said, what's I mean? This is maybe one of my final questions, and we um, open the floor for the audience. So, what do you think about the solution? Because some of people said this is not the final solution for this old paradox. Oh, you it's not the final yes. solution. No, it is not. What they showed is that um, if you assume the Ryu Taki and Nagi formula and entanglement wedge reconstruction then there are no further paradoxes. But that shifts the question to being, what kind of theory has the Ryu Takenagi formula and entanglement wedge reconstruction? That question doesn't have a satisfactory answer. But anyway, that's the question we have to focus on. Before, I would say that before the work of Almeri and others, there was a mess, and now there's a, a mystery which is in sharper focus than before. But it's certainly not solved. So, uh, Professor Mostam, this is also I return back maybe to one um, public question which come into the minds of many people. I mean, with us, that means what's now the main problem facing? I mean, string theory or a general M theory as a unified theory of everything. What's the main problem? Is it the non-perturbative regime as or um, other things, I mean, more fundamental than this? Like, for example, Nima Arkani, Hamid, and the others thinking that may be uh, about the uh, emergence of space-time and other things. So what do you think about hmm. What I say is most missing is that we don't have a fundamental understanding of what the theory is. Hmm. We've discovered a lot of things about it. But Einstein based his theory of gravity on concepts he understood. He had curve space-time and the principle of equivalence. We don't have the analog of those. So everything we discover kind of comes as a surprise because we don't understand where it's coming from. Now, possibly related to that, possibly not, is that our ideas about how to apply it in the real world are somewhat murky. Uh, I don't know if we can be successful at really applying M theory to understand the real world. I hope so, of course. I hope that somehow, uh, better theoretical understanding and maybe important experimental discoveries will somehow make contact. But um, uh, now, uh, if you uh, if you ask what you have to do to get a more fundamental understanding of M theory, of course, if I knew, I'd be working on it. But I don't know um, where there was there was big progress in the '90s with the understanding of the role of the dualities and the strong coupling behavior. But a few years earlier, if you'd asked me to predict where progress would be, I would have missed. I would not have anticipated that. So uh, if you ask me now, what's the most likely arena for progress? I think this general story about quantum information and gravity, of which you asked me about some aspects with the work of Almeri and others, and also um, the entanglement entropy, holographic entanglement entropy. Anyway, the story about quantum entanglement and quantum information and gravity is posing conceptual questions that we haven't really asked before. And we've at least made some progress with them. The work of Almeri and others was progress with some of these conceptual questions. Maybe one day it will look like baby steps, but uh, you know, a baby's first steps are big steps, even if later they'll look like baby steps. So you are, Professor, now with the opinion that maybe uh, the new path I mean to understand, I mean, M theory very well, is to look in between the relation between quantum information and quantum gravity. Well, I think that's the most interesting direction of current research. I'd make the following statement. We're missing some general insight about what string slash M theory means. And we're also missing some general insight about what quantum gravity means. Now, if you're an optimist, you'd hope that those two would eventually make contact. That's actually one point in which I'm reasonably optimistic. As you might have learned from this discussion, I often don't tend to be terribly optimistic. 
<clears throat> my skepticism about multinomial all of duality was an example, and we've probably discussed a few other examples. But one point we're actually unreasonably optimistic is the general insight about quantum gravity and general insight about string slash M theory will eventually make contact with each other. So uh, thank you so much, Professor. Maybe one of my last question, and as I said, we go. I mean, the audience is, uh, I mean, uh, two parts. We have great, um, uh, I mean, names in theoretical physics in Arabic world. So maybe mm -hmm. they have questions and also we go mm -hmm. to the audience. So um, some uh, are with them. Uh, Professor Nathan Seibeck last time he said, I mean, and even there is a quote uh, about him and uh, um, um, that we know that space for sure is, um, I mean, emergent phenomena, but time, I mean, um, make uh, physicists, I mean, divide the two. There is um, people like Lee Smolin and Steven Weinberg and all the big names, I mean, like two plus time. Think about time as fundamental things, I mean, uh, but the other, I mean, contribution right now, as I said, with string, uh, other string members you know, or uh, IAS members like Nima and the other one, think like the space time um, itself is an approximation of and is emergent from something uh, else and time is an emergent phenomena. So do you think what about your insight or a point of view about these things? And do you think that uh, consider time as an emergent or something like that or answering the question is time fundamental or um, uh, emergent will answer, uh, I mean, um, or solve some puzzles in theoretical physics? Thank you. Well, I don't have much insight, but if I had to guess, I would guess that time will eventually be seen as an emergent phenomenon along with space. Uh, but I think, I think that would have to come with some real advance because I don't think we have a sensible conceptual framework right now to think about time as an emergent phenomenon. So uh, thank you so much, Professor. I mean, for me, I have done, I mean, I, we discuss a bit uh, about unification, about string theory, about the dualities, about your work in Sharon Simon, topological field theories, not theory, a coban of homology. So for me, I am done. So maybe um, we need to, um, I mean, uh, go to the audience. So Ahmed, I think we uh, need to start, I mean, uh, that, to receive questions from the audience, starting by professors first. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Nada al-an bitaqil asile, man yawatar hussual, mumkin rafa al-yad, sana akhuz al-asma' bil-dur. سنراعي موضوع المتخصصين اولا دكاتره الجامع الاساس الافاضل ثم باقي الحضور الكرام نبدا مع بريس كويشن فروم ذا لاست تايم بيكوز اي سيد اند بروفيسور جمال ميموني سو بليز اوبن ذا مايك سو ثانك يس بروفيسور جمال يس مستر دكتور جمال يو كان اوبن يور مايك ناو You are still muted, Doctor. What about now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So it was a great opportunity for me to meet uh, Professor Witten, certainly. Uh, it will be unbecoming for me to ask a question about uh, supersymmetry since I have not really worked on it and I have, I'm not a fan of it really also. Uh, yet, uh, in a general sense, 40 years after uh, don't the first strides in this theory, uh, which certainly open up various uh, horizons, uh, heuristic horizon at least, uh, and nurtured reflections, we are still in a stalemate, really, as far as uh, making uh, uh, contact with the physical world, certainly, as you realize. Mm -hmm. You said uh, earlier, in the question of Mohammed, that you are in the line of uh, Steven Weinberg, uh, feeling that indeed the world has to, might be based on some unified idea or a beautiful uh, kind of unification somewhere. Would you say, and that's my first question, would you say that if Suzy doesn't work, then nothing else would work in terms of unify the whole field of physics, the whole field of the material world? That's my first part. What do you think that uh, Suzy is there, or if it is no Suzy, there is nothing in terms of unification? Well, uh, that's, uh, if I may. I'd never say it's string slash M theory or nothing. What I would say is that the only idea we have that's interesting is string slash M theory. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's either string slash M theory or it's nothing that we know about presently. 
that's different from what you asked. You asked me if it was string slash M theory or nothing. I'm merely telling you that the theory we know about that's an interesting direction and has given us valuable insights uh, is string slash M theory. When I say that it's given us valuable insights, one aspect of it among many is what I said in answer to one of the earlier questions that string slash M theory has given us a lot of insights about existing theories. I gave one example where quantum uh, work confinement is better understood because of developments involving string slash M theory. But another example just for fun would be that positive energy in general relativity is a bit of a mystery, but has a simple explanation that involves supersymmetry, which I had the good luck to discover about 40 years ago. Yes, Professor, we hear you. Professor? You finished your uh, answer? Oh, I the answer, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. نذكر الأساتذة الأفاضل بإبقاء أسئلة في موضوع العلوم دون الخروج إلى أي مواضيع أخرى وأن يكون السؤال مباشرا ومختصرا ضمن دقيقة حد أقصى الدور الآن للدكتور الحسن سعيد تفضل دكتور فرصة I would like to thank Professor Edward Witten for the nice excursion through many topics in basic physics. Following your discussion with Dr. Akram, could you please give a comment on anomalies in TFT and if there exists a unified description of these anomalies? Thank you. Well, uh, it in relativistic theories in four dimensions, the anomalies that we usually study are anomalies of fermions. And to me, the unified explanation of anomalies, or the unified formula for anomalies, involves the eta invariant in one dimension more. What most familiar to people is that Chern Simon's theory uh, is that perturbative anomalies in four dimensions are related to Chern Simon's in five dimensions. But if you want to extend that to include perturbative and non-perturbative anomalies, you should use the eta invariants as well as transonomies, rather than transonomies. I essentially wrote a paper about that a long time ago, but just one or two years ago, I wrote a recent paper about it with um, Kuzuya, Kazuya Yonikori. So if you want to see what I view, well, this is my current view, of the best way to give a unified picture of anomalies, I recommend a paper that was written about two years ago, a little less. Okay, thank you, Professor. I'll add one more remark. Those are anomalies for fermions in relativistic field theory. Okay, at least in four dimensional relativistic field theory. If you start including sophisticated theories of bosons in various dimensions, and also as considered in condensed matter physics, then the subject becomes a little more complicated. And there isn't a simple answer. In spirit, it's similar though. Anomalies in D dimensions are related to some kind of topological theory in D plus one dimensions. Maybe that's the unified picture, mm -hmm. more general than what I said with the eta invariant. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Professor. Soal an Ustaz Ahmed Mahmoud, Tabal. This is a quick reminder who no. wants to ask a question, please raise your hand on the chat, on the Zoom, so we can. Uh, find your name uh, in the queue, then we can give you the role to ask your question directly to Professor Rita. Hello, yes. Professor. Hello, Professor. Uh, professor, I, stu I self study physics. Uh, I study uh, calculus as self study, but uh, I don't uh, know what can I do after I finish uh, a textbook. Uh, what can I do to? Uh, to get to the stage of uh, making, uh, doing a research, doing your research. Uh, as well, a self -study. First of all, I admire self-study with textbooks and that's great. It's a little hard to really get to the research level purely from self-study. 
because to do research, you usually need to be familiar with current questions. And it's hard to learn current questions just from papers because people only understand, explain what, in papers what they understand, not what they don't understand. Or they usually don't explain well what they don't understand. So um, to really get to the research level, it will be more effective if you're interacting with people who are doing research. Thank you, Professor. سؤال الآن دكتور رفيق رفيق دكتور رفيق رفع اليد ليس على الشاشة تفضل بكل أحوال بالزوم في خيار رفع اليد حتى حتى ما كملوا اسمك تفضل بكل أحوال Okay thank you thank you I would like to ask Professor Witten about uh, the the year 1995 the famous 1995 when he unified all these five superstring theories in one in one M theory so I'm not really a stringist, but I'm just asking, I'm really curious about this S and T dualities. And uh, I would like to ask you, what is the physical, if it exists, of course, some physical um, motivation for introducing this kind of dualities? Is it just for the beauty of mathematics to have super symmetric, you know, uh, framework or is just it, how, it, how it was for you at the first sight? Well, I only became involved when all kinds of stuff had been done by other people. So let's go farther back. The earliest indication of duality is that Maxwell's equations in vacuum are symmetrical between electricity and magnetism. However, in the real world, we have electric charges and no magnetic monopoles. So that seems to break the symmetry. But then uh, with modern quantum unified theories, they predict that there are monopoles. We haven't discovered them. It might be that perhaps that's because of cosmic inflation. The inflationary universe was invented in part to explain why it's so hard to find monopoles. But our theories seem to have charges and monopoles. And then Montonin and Olive and Gordon Montonin and Olive, as we discussed earlier, suggested that there could be a symmetry between charges and monopoles in a quantum theory. And we discussed earlier the fact that I was actually a little skeptical of this, but I did some work with Olive which actually advanced the idea, but didn't convince me the idea was correct. But it's kind of seemed like a curiosity. But then also in the seventies, there was the mystery of quark confinements. And it's a big physical problem. Why are, is it the proton and neutron are made out of quarks, but we never see an individual quark? Well, left Mandelstam and others pointed out that in a superconductor, electrons would be confined. Oh, sorry, in a superconductor, monopoles would be confined. That if you put a magnetic monopole in a superconductor, its magnetic flux would be trapped into a flux field and the energy would grow as you separate it from the edge of the sample. Right. And then they said that confinement of quarks, which is a fundamental mystery about the strong interactions, was related by electric magnetic duality to what happens in a superconductor. And that was a brilliant idea, but it was hard to make concrete progress with it. But it gave a motivation for studying electric magnetic reality, it, namely to better understand the strong interactions. So one of the things that happened in the 90s was that the idea of connotation of monopoles to explain confinement became far more concrete because of a lot of development, some of which we discussed in this um, interview, including my work with Cyborg. And, a variety of things done by other people. So to, to summarize, there are all kinds of potential motivations for duality. There's the properties of Maxwell's equations. There's the mystery of quark confinement. There's simply the desire to understand how physics behaves for strong, when quantum effects are big, how to understand strong coupling. So different people were interested for all kinds of different reasons. And it all came together beautifully. I don't claim to have been one of the first to understand it was important. Yeah, so uh, just another question, uh, Professor Witten. Uh, I mean, we know that we have two kinds of candidates for the grand unification theory, right? So we have loop quantum gravity vs. Uh, M theory or super string theory. Um, if you would to like to, to compare the two, like, I mean, what's the drawbacks of the two? I mean, if you have to compare the two challenging theories, so what you will do, I mean, in my eyes, there's only one theory. So string slash M theory is something. 
loop quantum gravity is just a restatement of the problem. Okay. And the final question, just the most famous question is what M stands for? So <laughs> what, is the, what is the M? <laughs> I didn't intend to create a mystery there. And I'm sorry that I confused people with that. So <laughs> I had colleagues at the time who thought it was a membrane theory, but I thought that was oversimplified. I didn't want to call it membrane theory. At the same time, I didn't want to take, say my colleagues were wrong and I didn't even know for sure they were wrong. So I kept the M for membrane and said, the time will tell whether M stands for membrane or something else like magic or mystery. <laughs> mystery is what's the time is. Yes. So really the M was for membrane. I thought my colleagues would understand that M was really for membrane, but that I was skeptical whether it was really a membrane. Theory. <laughs> but I was a little too playful to say that explicitly and inadvertently I created a mystery that I didn't intend. Thank you so much for your answer. Yeah. Professor, thank you, Sarafi. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, this presentation. So I have two questions. My first question is, uh, strings are made of what? And uh, this, the second question is about, uh, so what the supersymmetry tells us about the mysterious dark matter in, in the universe? Well, the first question, what strings are made out of? doesn't have a good answer that's known. So string theory is, mi is missing a fundamental understanding. Uh, you might naively want to build strings out of little bits of strings that obey equations that force them to fit together. I'd love to do that, but I don't know technically how to do it. And as I said during the interview, we're actually missing a really satisfactory fundamental explanation of what string theory means, which I hope would someday make contact with a better understanding of what is quantum gravity in general. Um, sorry, what was the second question? Remind me the second question. I think you had to. Uh, what the supersymmetry uh, tells us about the mysterious dark matter in the universe? Oh, well, so unfortunately, our understanding isn't precise enough to make a specific prediction. So I'd rather answer a more narrow question, which is whether I have a favorite candidate that I really like for dark matter. So I do, which is what people call fuzzy dark matter. The idea of an extremely light scalar field, almost massless with a de Broglie wavelength, well, a Compton wavelength of light years, a de Broglie wavelength of thousands of light years, which would keep it from being compressed too much in the galactic center. So, I wrote a paper a few years ago about this with astronomers. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Ostriker and uh, Tremaine. Uh, so, you know, um, there isn't decisive evidence for that or any other candidate for dark matter, but that's the one that I'm most interested in. I have to tell you though that 20 years ago, I would have told you about WIMPs, which apparently turned out to be wrong. So it was very likely I could be wrong again, but it's currently my favorite candidate for dark matter. Some astronomers believe it's already ruled out, but this depends upon tricky interpretations of tricky and somewhat contested observational data where people disagree about what measurements, how big the systematic effects are and what measurements are really solid. So. Uh, since some of the leading, okay, it's true some of the leading astronomers think that we know fuzzy dark matter is wrong, but that's not generally accepted. So as long as it's not generally accepted, I'm going to stick with hoping that that's the right interpretation. So next uh, question. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, Merci. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the, once more the, the committee orga uh, organizer. I, will, I want also to thank uh, uh, Professor uh, Edwin uh, Wiesen to give us this opportunity. Uh, my question is, uh, as um, many scientists uh, believe that uh, cosmology now is in critical situation, uh, 
I think uh, uh, this is what I want to, to ask you, Professor, is a comment on this, that we, sh we should hear and learn uh, from uh, experiment and observation in order to build a new and new and beauty and simple theory rather than super string theory or M theory or other complicated one. Maybe we should have new and simple theory to, to be uh, in concordance with the, the observation, observation and the experiment. Please, would you comment on this, please? Thank well, you. That's hard to comment. Um, I wish you good luck in finding a new theory that would be a worthy competitor. Did, did you hear that answer? I just got a message to unmute myself. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Okay. So, so Al 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 An, the Doctor Doctor Basil, تفضل. Professor Basil. Hello, Professor Rutin. Thank you very much for this talk. I have two questions. The first question is technical, perhaps. Uh, concerning your paper in 1999, where you consider the, uh, the title of the paper is String Theory and Non-Commutative Geometry. This is a very, very vital subject in my opinion. In that paper, you consider minimally coupled scale uh, fields yeah. uh, only. Uh, I wonder, my first question is, I wonder if you have considered uh, conformally cu coupled sc scalar fields, uh, because I, as far as I know, I've worked on, on this. Uh, th there is a difference in the result, and uh, this is a vital difference because we, we getting introduced, we are introducing then the curvature by, by putting the conformally coupled field. My second question is, uh, is rather popular. It is, it says that we, uh, from time to time, we hear that uh, the dynamics of the universe is equivalent to uh, conformal field theories, something like that, or a field theory of uh, many uh, particle uh, system, many quantum system. And that is the, I think the basic duality which has been considered by uh, through, through string theory. Gravitational dynamics to put it properly, it is always said or frequently said that gravitational dynamics of the universe is equivalent to the dynamics of quantum many body systems. Whereas we actually, what, what we see in, in string theory is the IDS. This applies to IDS. IDS is, it applies to eventually to black holes. It doesn't apply to a realistic universe. Uh, as you said um, during your yeah. talk on yes. uh, discussion with Dr. Fallah, you have difficulties with the positive cosmological constant, and the real universe apparently is a, mm -hmm. contains a, a positive uh, uh, a cosmological it's, constant. We don't understand everything, as you're saying. Yeah. So uh, uh, here is my question. I mean, can't we bo be uh, a little bit more modest and say that in some cases we 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 have the gravitational dynamics getting or being equivalent to some yes. kind of, yeah. This is my second question. I mean, whether I'm correct or not, I don't know. You you know better in this case because you are much more involved in the field and you are the, the founder of many. Well, well, the second one, I completely agree with you. We've got the duality between gravity and ordinary gauge theory for negative cosmological constant. We don't know what's the analog for positive cosmological constant. Correct. We had a seminar by Lenny Suskind, a Zoom seminar at the Institute just Monday, 
on exactly this question. So um, that's a problem and it's probably a big problem since as you say, the, the case of a slightly positive cosmological constant looks like it's a good approximation to the real world. Um, I don't know what to say. You can't always solve the problems you want to solve. You solve the problems you can solve. Mm. So people were able to discover what, well, a non-perturbative description of quantum gravity, a background independent non-perturbative description when the cosmological constant is negative. We'd like such a description in more realistic cases for cosmology and in particular with the cosmological constant. We don't have it. You're, you're completely right in your remarks. Mm. Uh, my first question was about the conformally coupled scalar field, whether you have involved in this commutative geometry. And... Well, I personally have not looked at that. Good question. You haven't? Mm. Good question, but I have not looked at it. Mm. I would love to see work on that. Perhaps I'll try myself because I can, as far as I can see, and from my experience in the semi-classical approach, we worked with, with J with John Stewart Dowker uh, on the semi-classical approach uh, in quantum field theory in care with space-time. Uh, and I found that there are uh, really uh, very interesting results coming when you consider the conformally coupled fields. Mm -hmm. Well, conformally coupled fields are certainly interesting in general. I've not studied them in this context. Yes, thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Putin, and thanks for the organizers, uh, Dr. Akram and uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed. Um, it's really, uh, we are really grateful for this opportunity. Uh, my question is, uh, there is uh, some new insights about uh, complex space-time. Uh, there is a new theory that uh, introduced uh, complex space-time. Uh, can this uh, be compatible with the string theory, complex space-time, which is uh, consists from uh, real space-time and uh, imaginary space-time? The real space-time uh, stands for the um, photons uh, and uh, elementary particles. Uh, like, let's see more uh, accurate the bosons uh, that are moving at speed of light. And the complex, the imaginary part stands for the classical objects. Thanks. Well, with that interpretation, I don't know. There's a much more conservative interpretation where complex space-time is a technical tool to do calculations that are applicable to real space-time. The well, a historical example is by Gibbons and Hawking, who used the Euclidean black hole to explain black hole thermodynamics, which they wanted to apply to the real black hole is a real object. In other words, they did an imaginary space, they did a calculation with imaginary time to better understand what was happening with real time. So that's the conservative application and that one I'm sure is true. And I'm pretty sure more things about it will be discovered. I can't comment usefully on the more radical interpretation you suggest. There's also another more radical interpretation which I don't see much very good concrete ideas about but it's intriguing which is the idea that the string momentum and winding would be accommodated better in a theory that was fundamentally formulated in a complex space time. So I think my brief answer to your question is that for sure, complex space time is useful as a technical tool. I'd say it's unknown, unclear, whether it has a more radical interpretation. Thank you so much, bro. Thank you. Thank sure. you, Professor. Uh, so I'll start best, Fadal. Hello, Professor. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Actually, I have uh, one question. Do you think we can have uh, quantum disturbances or any quantum effects without any space time? Actually, I'm talking about the moment before Big Bang. I cannot say a moment, but it's a moment before Big Bang. Thank you very much. Well, it's hard to comment usefully about that. To me, this is a question about a moving space time. It's, to make any sense about what there was near the Big Bang, you probably need a deeper understanding of what space-time means. So my guess is the question will eventually be wrapped up with the question of emergent space-time. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Professor. سؤال الآن سال حسين تفضل. Uh, did you say Brock? Uh, yes. Uh, welcome, sir. What is the difference between a mathematical model and a physical model? And is it right to apply a mathematical model without physics? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there's a continuum between models that are only of mathematical interest at the one extreme and models that are directly applicable to a physical system in the other extreme. And then in between, there are models that have some similarity to a physical system and are partly studied for their mathematical interests. There are all kinds of combinations in between. Thank you, Professor. So I'll start Yusuf, Fadal. How are you? Mm, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go directly to your question, please. Uh, hi, Professor. I'm very happy to talk to, to you. I am very happy. I want uh, I want to, to, to tell you that uh, my master's degree now in between uh, uh, black hole and uh, dark matter and string theory. We will use M theory to uh, find link between dark matter and black hole. My question is, what is the degree of freedom in black hole? And sometimes we... We describe black hole in four dimension and sometimes in five dimension. What is the difference between them? Well, we don't very know, well know what the degrees of freedom in black holes. So for black hole, we think it can be described from the outside by Hilbert space, whose dimension is that which is suggested by the beckinson hawking entropy. But we have only a hazy idea of how to describe that Hilbert space more explicitly. Uh, for supersymmetric black holes, in a sense, you could say that the building blocks are the D-brains studied by Vafa and Strominger and other people. But that involves an extrapolation between the black hole and a different description in a different region of parameters. I think there's a basic murkiness about what how you should think about the degrees of freedom of a black hole. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Another question? Yes, but very quickly, please. I wanted to ask about string theory in particle physics. Can he can he solve the problem in a standard model, special origin of mass? Well, uh, the part of the problem of the origin of math, mass, which is unsolved, is why the Higgs particle is has the mass it does rather than being much heavier, and. Most physicists before the LHC experiments, and regardless of their attitude about supersymmetry, string theory, or anything else, thought that the, if you could reach LHC energies, you would discover a mechanism that would explain why the Higgs particle is not heavier. That hasn't happened, and it's a bit of a mystery. So as of right now, I can't tell you how that problem is solved. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. So I'll start with Mohammed, Fadda. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, uh, what's the professor's view on, uh, yeah, opinion on the prospect of achieving deterministic interpretation of the quantum mechanics instead of the Copenhagen interpretation in light of the recent uh, bounce and droplet oil experiments uh, and some sort of, uh, some sorts of these experiments. So, can uh, superfluid dynamics present a gate towards uh, better insights, deeper insights on the on the realm of uh, quantum mechanics, and perhaps uh, the con the uh, binding between both realms? So, what's your opinion, your assessment of this kind of direction? I'd be extremely skeptical. That we'll ever uh -huh. that we'll ever have a deterministic world again. If if there's any change in the fundamentals of quantum mechanics, I would expect it, it to become stranger. But I don't think it will go back to our classical intuition. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Burak. 
uh, dear professor, first of all, this is my condemnment to be talking to you right now and asking a question. Actually, I am a high school student from uh, Turkey and I'm trying to understand quantum physics and uh, mathematics behind it in terms of topology. And as far as I could see, um, I'm seeing that the V brains uh, are now enough ex to explain topologically the reason behind the 10 dimensional uh, superstring theory. But uh, we know that there have never been a supersymmetrical particles observed yet. And do you think DASI in Germany or CERN in Switzerland would be enough to detect such a particle? And do you think in terms of the philosophy, would determining this particle literally like uh, either using electrical engineering, computer science, or some other multidisciplinary technologies um, would be uh, good enough to support this idea? Or is still mathematics and topology is the best way to prove that a supersymmetric particle may exist in superstring theory, except then the D brain um, in mathematics? Well, these are a lot of big questions. It's hard to answer them all at once. You said you're a high school student. So it's great to have these interests and hopefully when you get to the university, you'll study at a more advanced level and um, be able to grapple with the questions for yourself. I'm not sure what I can add to that right now, uh, beyond things that I already said earlier in the interview. So I think I'm going to stop here and, and wish you success with your studies. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. So I'll start Ahmed Al Qaisi, Fadal. Yeah, thanks. It's, uh, it's my honor to be talking to you, Professor Witten. Um, first of all, I'm in high school in Jordan. Uh, my question is, can someone be a mathematician and mathematical physicist at the same time? So for me, I'm very interested in math in differential geometry, number theory, topology, and physics, the relativity, yes. quantum field theory. I can, what should I get into undergraduate in college? Thanks in advance. Well, of course. So your question is basically if you should do math or mathematical physics to give sensible advice, it really will depend on you. Where are you, at what level are you in your studies? No, no, I'm in high school. You're in high school. Well, in that yeah. case, it's far in the future for you to make this decision. At least in the US system, you would make the, well, you could, as an undergraduate, you could study both math and physics and learn everything you can. Well, you really would have to make a choice in graduate school. Uh, well, of course I can't, I, there are very few people like Kevin Costello who managed to really work effectively as both mathematicians and physicists. But most people as students, as graduate students are going to need to make a choice. And by the time you have to make that choice, you would hopefully know much more than you know now. So I think I should just wish you success in learning a lot as an undergraduate and being able in a couple of years to make the right choice for yourself. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor Edward Witten. It's my honor talking to you today. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, my pleasure and good luck. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for uh, the conference. My question is, we know that uh, according to thermodynamics, uh, entropy can only increase. Uh, now, uh, according to the, the, the Bekenstein Hawking equation, the, the entropy is directly proportional to the area of the black holes. And according to the Stephen Hawking, black holes can evaporate. Yes. Uh, um, uh, now, if the uh, if the the black hole a uh, black hole evaporates, then its area will also increase decrease. Yes. And if the uh, the area decreases, therefore the entropy of the black hole will decrease also. That what is not compatible of uh, with the thermodynamics, which state that entropy can only increase. Yes. Well, that's a very good question. What happens is that when the black hole evaporates, the outgoing radiation has entropy. 
And yeah. the, rate, the entropy of the radiation is actually bigger than the entropy the black hole is losing. So the thermodynamic entropy of the system increases when the black hole evaporates. Black hole evaporation is thermodynamically irre irreversible. It increases the thermodynamic entropy. So you're asking a good question, and the answer involves the entropy of the radiation. Uh, yes, the, yes, uh, yes, Professor. Thank, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, please, can I... thank you, Mr. Hassan. سؤالاً اتفقنا على سؤال واحد لكل شخص لو سمح. السؤال الآن أستاذ أحمد البيزاوي. Yes, hello. Yes. So my yeah. So my name is Ahmed, and my 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 question to Professor Wynn is: uh, Can a physical autodidact uh, be a competent theoretical physicist, and might he be accepted to do graduate studies without formal education? Like, would you work with an autodidact who is who you think is competent? Yeah, well, that's my question. Be accepted at graduate school. You'd have to prove your competence. Have you? Do you have an undergraduate degree? No, actually, I'm a, I'm, I'm actually a, a 19 years old uh, major, but I'm really studying physics extensively. But I I just started like old? seven months ago, and did you say you're 19? Sorry, you said you're 19. You're yeah, old? I'm 19 years old. Well, yes, I'm 19 years old, and I'm. It's a little too early to be applying. I'm to planning to 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 study. Yeah, it's just a plan that I'm going to, that I'm making. Like uh, I want to uh, study until I, I, I somehow have a good mastery of the undergraduate curriculum and then apply to graduate school. So would you accept such an uh, such a CV? It's going to be hard. You would need to take the GRE exam and do very well on it to be seriously considered by a U.S. university. Why do you is is undergraduate school not an option? Most people will do better to go to undergraduate school. Uh, is there a reason you're not? Yes. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I don't, you can. I would like to hear another word about this. Mm -hmm. this person. Sure, sure. Uh, undergraduate school is not an option for you, for your situation. It's not an option for me since it's. Uh, it's it's a family issue, but I've, I've somehow uh, I tell you, I I'm, I've uh, somehow decided to, to take it on myself. You know, I just wanted to study extensively until I reach the 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 the, the level with, in which uh, at which students apply to graduate schools. So if I reach the level, uh, if I really master the topics, not just in a in a in a in a, in a, in a fake way, I really really master it. Would I be accepted to do graduate studies? Would I be taken seriously even if I score very high in GRE? Well, I can't guarantee you would be accepted. That's going to be very hard. Uh, what you're trying to do is extremely hard. I would recommend, uh, I would really recommend finding a way to get an undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. Unless it's truly impossible. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so I'll, um, this is just a quick, a quick reminder. Uh, who wants to ask a question, please raise your hand on Zoom so I can see your name and give you the turn to, uh, to ask whatever you want. Now, so Alan, Mr. Abdul Hamid, Kerko, Mr. Abdul Hamid. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I hear you. Um, first, I thank, uh, um, thank you, um, uh, Professor Edouard Wicken for uh, this nice uh, conference. My question uh, is uh, brief. Uh, do you think uh, that in the future we can verify this theory experimentally? Because any theory for it uh, to be valid must, uh, must be validated uh, experimentally, uh, such as uh, general relativity uh, mm -hmm. with uh, wave gravitation. Thank you. Well, I, I hope we'll be able to verify the theory experimentally, but of course I don't know. It depends on what progress is made both in theory and in experiment. It, yes. depends, it depends in part on what the answer is, how hard it, how hard it is to verify. And it depends, you know, it depends somewhat on luck. All mm -hmm. we can do is the best we can do. We don't know in advance what that's going to be. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. And Mr. Jalal Hassan, 
استاذ جلال حسن تسمعنا؟ طيب استاذ زياد Yes, um, I have just one question for Dr. Rob um, about uh, what's your opinion about the quantized uh, inertia, the new theory proposed by Mike uh, Morkic? Uh, I'm unfortunately not too familiar with it, so I can't comment very knowledgeable, I'm afraid. So there's a new theory about proposed by physicist uh, Mike Morkic from University of Portland, UK. Yes. Uh, saying there is a get rid of the um, the dark matter is saying that there is a quantized inertia is based on concept of Casimir effect, this radiation cosmos. And when the galaxies get rotated, there should be inertia force there. Uh, I'd personally be surprised if there's not dark matter, but with that said, I don't know the details of this theory to comment on it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Professor. Sual says Ibrahim, who is an SF. Says Ibrahim, Tawadda Dora. Says Ibrahim. That's Mauna. Says Yusuf Abdul Muhaymin, Tawadda. Hello, hello. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Dr. Bussein Ibrahim. Dr. Abussein, yes, please. Yes. Thank you, for uh, Professor, for your uh, valuable information. Uh, actually, I have uh, general questions about uh, if you, uh, if, uh, do you mind if uh, there is any effects from the string theory on uh, some uh, basic facts like uh, uh, special uh, relativity theory. Uh, I think special relativity theory is here to stay. So uh, uh, Einstein modified the theory yeah. with gravity. So with gravity, special relativity theory is modified. But as a local statement where you can ignore gravity, I think special relativity is here to stay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank sure. you, sir. Uh, Ustad uh, Yusuf, Hi, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Professor Raikin uh, about uh, his conversation with uh, Abdul Salam. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation. Uh, the question is, what is the application of string theory in cosmology? Uh, string theory hasn't been very successfully applied yet in cosmology. Well, Okay. The most interesting possible application, there are different views about cosmology. So inflation, the inflationary universe has got pretty good uh, observational support. Inflation has the property that once you get, it starts, it's very difficult to end it completely. So inflation tends to be what's called internal inflation. Because of problems like the problem of the cosmological constant or dark energy, and also the problem of the hierarchy, the mass of the Higgs particle, which we discussed. I, uh, we discussed this in answer to one of the questions before, but we didn't get into this aspect. Some physicists have favored a multiverse interpretation of the universe with different vacuum states in different parts of the universe with different laws of elementary particles. And we live in one that's favorable for the existence of complex structure. So it is under some interpretations true that string theory has got the right dynamics to produce that kind of a picture. So that's a proposed application of string theory to cosmology. I don't know if it's correct. Thank you, Professor. Sual Al-Akhir says Ayub, Tadal. Said Ayub, that's Mona. Okay, the question, Mr. Albert, Fadal. Uh, I have, I think, uh, uh, Ahmed. Yes, doctor. I think uh, Professor uh, Tawfiq Wali, uh, last time he didn't, I mean, uh, maybe uh, Professor Witten here, he's, uh, I mean, uh, 
questions very well. So, Professor Tawfiq Wali, please, can you uh, open the mic and uh, set your question again, please, for me? Thank you. Hi. Uh, I don't know if he heard me or not. So. Yes, we can hear Yes, yes, you can. Uh, we, have, we are hearing you. You can repeat the question or ask all the questions, Professor. So oh, my, question, my, my question is simple. Uh, it's just uh, that uh, superstring theory or other uh, theory are complicated uh, in cosmology. And uh, maybe we should have a simple and uh, simple and beauty theory which can be in uh, in concordance and conform uh, conformity with experiment. Well, I think but I did my, hear the question. My and question, my question <laughs> is, maybe we can we, maybe we can hear or or learn from experiment and observation mm -hmm. to have uh, a, a directive to construct and build new and simple theory rather than. Uh, mm -hmm. super string or M theory, which are very complicated. And actually maybe they are excluded from ex experiment. Thank you. I did hear this question. And as I answered before, my answer was to wish you good fortune in finding such a new theory. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank okay. Thank you. 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 Hello, Professor. Hello. I'm supremely grateful to talk to you. Um, I've been working on some kind of proof on the creation of the universe out of false vacuum fluctuations. And I've been faced by, um, after analytically solving the wheeler duet equation, like uh, arbitrary constants in place uh, of the nucleation rate of the universe per unit volume, like, should those arbitrary constants have some properties that we could find? Like they can't be dimensionless, you see. Well, first of all, I don't know precisely what you've done, but we don't really understand how to solve the wheeler duet equation, except with highly idealized assumptions. Um, to the extent that you find arbitrary constants in these solution, what that means is that there are different quantum states possible. I don't know whether the theory should ultimately predict what the state is. If it does, I'm pretty sure that that's a big state that has all kinds of possibilities. So I'm not sure exactly how illuminating the answer would be, but um, I can imagine just in general terms, I can imagine two options. One is the state is, is uniquely determined, but somehow it describes all kinds of possibilities. Two is the state is not uniquely determined. And then when you solve the wheeler dewitt equation, there are a lot of arbitrary constants that label the possible states. Uh -huh. it's hard to more than that. Thank you, Professor. El Sual, Ms. Begum, Oz. Yes, please. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Begum, I'm a high school student from Turkey as well. First of all, I have to say it's an honor to be here with you and to be able to ask you a question, but it will be a really simple question as well because I'm not really aware of the topic. I know it's a really hard thing to do, but uh, knowing that you're a great physicist, I'd like to ask you, what is string theory in a simplified way and what it is about and what's its purpose? Well, it's easier to answer what its purpose is. So in 20th century physics, there were two big theories. One was quantum theory of atoms, molecules, and subatomic particles. And then there was Einstein's theory of gravity, which we call general relativity. It applies to stars, galaxies, and the whole universe. But stars are ultimately made out of atoms. So it doesn't make sense to have one theory for atoms and another theory for stars. They have to work together somehow. However, it was found that it's very difficult to make quantum field theory, the theory of the atoms and subatomic particles, work consistently with gravity. The framework in which physicists found that they can be put together consistently is string slash n theory. But as we've explained in pre answer to previous questions, we don't understand string slash n theory that well. 
we're still struggling with what it is at a basic level. But anyway, its purpose is to make sense of how gravity and quantum mechanics can work together, to state it in one sentence. That was the answer to some of your questions. I can't remember, if, oh, the other, what, what is string theory in simple terms? The simplest answer that some people would give is this, naively an electron is a point particle, but in quantum mechanics, because of the uncertainty principle, it's subtle what you mean by a point particle. Its position is always fluctuating because of quantum uncertainty. You should think of a point particle as a fuzzy cloud. And then in relativistic quantum mechanics, it's even more subtle because of pair creation. What you think is an electron might really be two electrons on a positron. String theory adds a new kind of fuzziness to that picture where classically the electron is not a point, but a little, little loop of string, a little loop of vibrating string. But you have to imagine it's a quantum loop of vibrating string, which is hard to imagine, just like the point particle was hard to imagine, but it's a fuzzy loop of vibrating string but string theory adds a new kind of fuzziness. Its importance is that the string can vibrate with many shapes. So if you play middle C on a piano, you'll also hear higher harmonics because the same string whose vibration produces middle C also produces higher overtones. Well, for this kind of string, it can vibrate in many different shapes and forms and those different states of vibrations correspond to the different types of elementary particles assuming that string theory is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for answering this question. Thank you for your lecture. Dr. Akram, you in the final word for you and then for Professor Witten. I think uh, before I give the last word, maybe you can give your last word. I mean, using Arabic in the audience. After that, you can give our uh, last word. After that, because I will close the meeting. The final word will be in Arabic. Uh -huh. okay. Your word and then Dr. Witten. No problem. So, okay. So, uh, Professor, again, thank you so much. I mean, um, for accepting my invitation, it was a great honor and pleasure for me. I mean, um, for the first part of the interview, we discussed a lot, I mean, of uh, unifications about string theory, dualities, necessity of uh, non perturbative dualities in string theory, M theory, Kovanov homology and um, uh, also not theory, how to go from not theory to Kovanov, uh, necessity also for four-dimensional share and Simons, all topics maybe in theoretical physics, and we close by quantum information, and you said that maybe the new uh, insight for you or the new direction towards solving the actual puzzles in theoretical physics is uh, toward maybe, uh, see, um, I mean, combining or uh, quantum information and the relation between quantum information and quantum gravity. So first of all, I said, thank you so much again. And uh, maybe uh, as last word, can you give us your advice? Uh, I mean, to your audience, um, as I said, what's a new, um, uh, how to say directions um, in string theory or uh, elsewhere, uh, I mean, to uh, tackle the actual puzzles uh, in theoretical physics. Do you think that there is a new revolutions or I mean, uh, or what do you think? So the question is, where do I think there might be a new uh, revolution coming in theoretical understanding? Yes. So as I kind of indicated previously in answer to some of the questions, what I think is most exciting right now is our developments involving quantum information and gravity. And if you tell me that something big is going to happen in the next decade, I think that's where it's most likely to happen. No guarantees, of course, but but it does feel that something big might happen there. As for my advice for everyone, well, the audience is so varied and diverse that the same advice wouldn't apply well to everyone. I wish you all good fortune and success for those who are students, all good success and fortune with your studies and in finding your way. And hopefully we'll meet in person on some future occasion, perhaps in your own countries, perhaps in the United States. In the meantime, Thanks very much for this invitation and for the nice discussion we've had today. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Professor, Thank you so for being with you. شكرا لكم جميعا. كان لقاء غنيا بالمعلومات والأفكار. نرجو أن يكون ممتعا ومفيدا لكم جميعا. ندعوكم لمتابعة اللقاءات القادمة في التاسع من نيسان أبريل. سجوه في التقويم لديكم. 
سيكون لدينا لقاء مع حامل جائزة نوبل البروفيسور بيبل وندعوكم لمتابعة جميع اللقاءات السابقة والقادمة من سلسلة على أكتاف العمالقة on the shoulders of giants التي تكرم الدكتور أكرم بالسعي للقاء مع كبار القامات في الفيزياء نلقاكم على خير وإلى اللقاء Bye bye guys. See you then. Bye bye. Ciao. Christopher, take care. Christopher, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, you everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for everyone.